Welcome to The Heart of the Matter. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Science and technology are paving the way for economic success, but is our region keeping up? Stay tuned for The Heart of the Matter. Science, technology, engineering, and math. The United States is no longer the dominant leader in these fields the way it once was. A national alarm is being sounded, but what is taking place in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa? Field reporter Donnie Rolls has this report. At first glance, it's a room full of students, some poster board, and science experiments. But you're looking at the biggest and quite possibly the best science fair in Minnesota. This year, 320 middle and high schoolers took part. That's a huge number. These are some of our country's best and brightest young science minds. I believe that helping the environment is very important. 16-year-old Kate Geshwin went on to the International Science Fair last year for her project that created a model to estimate how much energy wind farms would generate. Eighth graders Enrique Zavala and Jacob Powell did a wind energy project too. They built a small wind turbine. And it will generate electricity. That powers a light bulb. But even with students like these, when it comes to science, our kids are falling behind. Between 1995 and 2007, United States fourth grader science scores went down slightly by three points. This while countries like Hong Kong, Slovenia, and Singapore went up by 46, 54, and 63. United States fourth graders came in sixth out of 16 countries in the report by the National Center for Education Statistics. Those numbers aren't just numbers, they're an emergency alarm sounding to scientists, economists, and policymakers who believe the future success of our country's economy depends on the quality of our future scientists. My science teacher got me turned around. Dr. Temple Grandin's passion for science was amplified by a form of autism that seemed to help her excel. But she says it was only possible because a science teacher helped nurture her talents. Now she's recognized nationally as a strong advocate for both autism and science education. And I'm really concerned about the shortage of science teachers. I talked to 600 uh, teachers at a large school district and there was only two high school science teachers. Grandin says in order to grow a new generation of brilliant scientists, more schools should have science fairs like this and we should make it easier for career scientists to become teachers. Well, there's all kinds of people that are uh, retired from tech industries and things that like, like that. They would love to teach biology. They she says focusing our energy on unleashing the talent of kids like these is important because we face some pretty big problems, problems that will need kids like these to solve. These are the people that are going to figure out the next, you know, how to solve the energy crisis. Whether or not we solve the big problems is largely in the hands of our children. So we thought we'd ask one of them what she thinks. It's like America's getting lazy and then these other countries are still moving forward. And so it's great for them. I think that all people should be trying as hard as they can. Just think America could try harder. Thank you, Donnie. Our in-studio discussion today will allow us to better understand the heart of this issue. Please welcome to the program, Roger Larson, teacher and director of the Rochester Regional Science Fair. Rebecca Bates, professor at Minnesota State University, Mankato. And Jim Burkle from Mad Science, Iowa. Thank you everyone for being here. Well, we just heard some statistics. I've got a couple more for you. Uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, put together some data that again shows the United States kind of in the middle of the pack. And Shanghai way out here in front. We've got some additional information from the Program for International Student Assessment. This is percentage of students at proficiency level on the science scale. And, and here's the United States, way down the list behind some other countries such as Greece, Croatia, I mean, that, that kind of surprised me. Statistics are numbers. Do statistics tell the story in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa? Partly. 
all of these, we get all of these numbers, and of course the stories that we have of the people that are living the experience might be very different. One of the things that we see with statistics is that there's often a bimodal distribution where there's two humps. And we have a lot of students who are doing really, really well, who come to college able to succeed, able to do research projects from a very early age. Um, but then we have students that don't do so well, and that's often related to poverty. And we also see it's often related to race. Um, in Minnesota, we have changing demographics. So we're starting to see fewer high school students in the majority white and more that are Hispanic or black. And we traditionally see a gap in their preparedness for college. And this is something that starts at kindergarten. And, okay. and Roger, you're in the classroom. What are you seeing? I, I would agree with Becky that, that, that we see the, the very same things. I think sometimes, though, we focus too, mu too much on the numbers and not the reasons why. You know, maybe we need to look at, uh, I think, first of all, if we actually look at the uh, numbers for Minnesota as compared to the rest of the country, Minnesota usually does extremely well in testing and in participation levels in science and academia. So I, I, I think that the, the numbers can be deceiving because we're saying United States rather than Minnesota, southeastern Minnesota. I think the uh, area in southeastern Minnesota with Mayo Clinic and IBM and the, the commercial business area were very, uh, very good. Uh, we're, I think, achieving at much higher level than what we see so in the statistics. We're in better shape than the rest of the country. Is there a need to turn things around? And Jim, if there were, where would you start? Well, absolutely there's a need. I mean, uh, it's fine to be good locally, but the world, as we all know, is increasing in its globalization. So our ability to interact uh, all over the United States as well as all over the, the globe is highly important. Uh, a little bit on that bimodal concept, one of my concerns is at the, at the high achievement level, the, the modal is, seems to be shrinking and getting smaller. At the low achievement end, the modal seems to be enlarging and getting bigger. And, and what's the answer? Is it more funding for curriculum at the lower grades? Is it more funding for science at the university level? Where, where do we start to address this issue? Is there a magic wand that you would wave and go, this will fix it? If we had a magic wand that said everybody helps, I think that would be great. Okay. Because we need to have parents involved. We need to have parents who will do science experiments with their five-year-old daughters. We need to have more science teachers, K through 12. We need to have more people in general in our population who are educated about science. Industry needs to step in and help. All of this, you know, I know I have students, college students, who are willing to go into classrooms as well and share their love of the, of whichever science they're learning. So these are all ways that we can start. There's a variety of venues to approach the issue, but parenting is certainly key in my mind. It seems that there's a lot of parents that will, when the children complain about science or math being difficult, they'll go down that avenue with them and say, well, don't worry about that. Maybe we can find something else for you to work on. And this is in the early years, uh, elementary, middle school, uh, and we can't afford to be doing at that level. We have to be pushing the kids farther in those earlier ages and then allowing them later in high school, perhaps, to be making some of those other decisions. Mm -hmm. Roger, well, you, do you have... I was going to mention that... Uh, in President Obama's State of the Union, you know, he said that education, science education, re really doesn't begin in the classroom. It really begins at home, and mm -hmm. and parents really need to turn the TV off and have the, their children do their homework. And that's really where it needs to be. Are there any resources that you need in the educational system that will help kind of the K-12 system prepare kids for the university level to pursue those advanced degrees? How well do we see those two enterprises meshing? With funding drying up, it's becoming more and more difficult to have the equipment needed to do the uh, kinds of science that we're talking about. It costs dollars, and every year with budget cuts, it's materials that get cut. So the, the declining funding, when we talk about funding, funding is a very big issue. Also time, the, time, the resource of time in the classroom, you don't have that much time. And if you're always preparing for tests, it's a very different kind of learning than the kind of exploratory learning that really feeds the creative scientist. That if you can go out and explore and just learn through exploring the world, 
then you have students who are really starting to learn science. And are kids ready? When they come to the university level, are they ready or do you find the, that universities have to do a fair degree of remedial? Yes and no. Some students are very, very ready, really prepared. I had a student who is now headed to graduate school, but in his very first semester of, of undergrad, he said, I'm going to go to grad school. Okay, so this was a very focused student. He was really ready. Um, but I have other students where I have to advise them to take you know, introductory math courses in order to prepare for what I would consider the first semester of college math. So it's, it, it's both. It's a mix. Jim, your specialty at Mad Science is to make science interesting and fun and engaging. Absolutely. How do you do that? Well, uh, the name uh, it starts out uh, helping us right from the word get-go. The uh, Mad Science is very attractive to children. And then from there, it's up to us the, to bring the programming forward to them in a very positive manner. And uh, one of the things that we always make sure when I'm training new mad scientists, it's like if you're doing anything that the kids could be doing, you need to be asking yourself why you're doing that. Whether it's filling a beaker up to 300 milliliter mark or swirling a flat bottom flask or whatever, the kids like the hands on. They really, they love it. They absolutely adore it. So uh, we try to get them very, very involved with the programming. And each one of our programs always has a hands-on make and take at the end of it. So the kids, no matter what happened during the one hour or whatever session, they're always walking away with having put something together themselves and taken it home to show mom and dad. And it's OK to get messy in the classroom? You ought to see my lab coat. <laughs> Well, and even in a classroom, you know, there's messy, like science messy, like, you know, liquids everywhere. But there's also making a classroom messy by moving the chairs around, mm -hmm. by not having everything in a square. That a lot of times my classroom is little clumps of circles with students talking and problem solving together as opposed to a square where I am, you know, the pontificator spreading the wisdom of science. That when they're engaged, whether it's with the hands-on, making things dirty, or whether they're messing up the room, so that they can really work on problem solving together. That's so that's kind of hands on is really important. I, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think we can forget the facts, however, and I, maybe that might bring us back to the statistics again. Why are the statistics, sh statistics showing what they're showing? It could be because maybe we're focusing sometimes more on the hands on and maybe not enough on the factual information that they need to have, which testing in a lot of cases is geared towards. towards writing. Yep. Roger, in your classroom, do you notice that there is a certain type of student that gravitates toward, and we're talking about science, technology, engineering, math, all of these STEM disciplines. Is there a particular type of student that engages in or excels in the, these fields? Well, I, I guess no. It depends upon the learner again. And uh, uh, visual learners do better in certain kinds of situations. Kinesthetic learners do better. Some people are auditory learners. Some are visual learners. We have all different kinds of learners. And they're going to do different. They'll have different attributes in different, different parts of the experiment. Uh, all kids, however, do like hands-on. If you get them engaged, you're going to have success, and, and ho hopefully that'll help. Becky, you've done some work on kind of personality traits of scientists yeah. and that you need them all. Yes, so it's a myth that the best scientist is an introvert who's not good with people so they can just go sit in a room and work on problems all day. We really need, and this is something industry repeatedly says that they want from us as, as undergraduate professors, we want students who can really communicate their ideas. They need to write well, they need to speak well. We want students who um, are creative, who can work together. We want students who understand the societal context and the ethics involved with what they're doing. So it means not just learning one thing, it means learning multiple things, but it also means, you know, maybe the person who you would typically say, oh, you would be great at marketing, maybe that person should be the engineer. If they have the math background, if they enjoy science, mm -hmm. then that kind of entrepreneurship, that kind of salesmanship of like, hey, this is great, we need that in the field as well. Mm -hmm. Science, technology, engineering, or math. I think that's exactly what uh, science fair is all about. Yes. I mean, yes. You, you've hit it right on the head because to me, that's where we're missing the boat by not having a more students and even larger participation involved in science fair. It's hands-on, it's writing, it's being the salesman for your project, right. it's selling what, what you've I learned. Did. Yeah, I did this, look at this. It's a hands-on kind of thing. 
the employers here have to know how important it is to have a well-educated base because that's where the future employees come from. And there's, the numbers also show that there aren't going to be enough graduates in STEM fields to meet any of the projected need. That in most states, it's about 10% under within about 10 years what, what we're expected to be able to, who, well, who we expect to hire, we just won't have the graduates. You know, again, from a business perspective, we set goals that are oftentimes unreachable, and we almost know that at the point that we set them. But I'm afraid in, in areas of STEM that we allow our goals to be something that are easily reached. Uh, uh, we, we just need to set our goals much, much higher and not be concerned about not hitting them all the time, but what were our successes along the way. And from what I understand, there are businesses right here in this region, in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa, that will employ these kids. Yes. They don't necessarily <laughs> have to leave. They can, but they don't necessarily right. have to leave the region to kind of fulfill that track mm -hmm. from learning in their K-12 to their To have college. a happy life <laughs> in, in the region. That there's a lot of people here who really love being here and living here. And the pipeline is here. We have the foundation for students to learn and to work and have good careers, but um, if they don't choose it, they won't be able to get into those relatively high paying jobs. Great. Well, thank you so much for your comments about this. It sounds like the one take home that we can take from this today is that it takes everyone. It takes parents, it takes educators, and it takes the business community to encourage and develop the interest and the abilities in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Thank Stephanie. You. All right. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for more on The Heart of the Matter. While industry, parents, and educators may want more students to pursue STEM fields of study, what do students think? Donnie Rolls asked them. What do you think about science class? I mean, science class is one of, the, one of my favorite classes because it's more interactive, hands-on type of learning rather than sitting in the classroom. Yeah, I like the hands-on stuff where I can actually see my reactions. I like science class. I like the hands-on part of labs. It's always been a class I've enjoyed. To be honest, seeing stuff up and making things explode is probably the funnest part. What do you want to do for a career? Recently, I decided that I would want to be more along the lines of a teacher because that fits my personality better. Well, a year ago I was thinking of a science type profession, but I've just like started some business classes and it's just something I like more than a science. Uh, I'd probably go somewhere in the business field, you know, marketing, sales, somewhere around there. To be honest, I don't really want to go into science. I want to be more of a business hotel management mostly. Why don't you want to be in like a science type career? The science field, you have to be very talented and skilled. You have to be a good thinker. And uh, I mean, I'm not a fan of math classes. I mean, I'm not really a fan of science, but I think it's a fun class. I mean, there's a lot of people who are suited to be like work in the science field. I don't think I'm one of them. Sometimes, like the math is difficult. Like math, I don't. I'm not really a math person, but um, like this year we're doing stoichiometry, so just like balancing different science equations, and sometimes that can get confusing. Like converting to different units of measurement. There's a lot of math and I'm not the best with math. For those students who are interested in STEM fields of study, our region is fortunate to have many companies who hire these graduates. One such company in Clear Lake, Iowa is TeamQuest. We sat down with David Burgart and Sarah Kramer to learn more. David Burgart, Sarah Kramer, thank you so much for being with us today. We're here at TeamQuest and we're talking about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields of study. And we're here at TeamQuest to talk a little bit about what kind of careers uh, students who study these fields can ultimately engage in. But what I'd like to do is kind of start at the beginning with you guys and learn a little bit more about how you got interested in the field uh, of study that you are currently employed in. And, and David, I'd like to start with you. What Do you have an early memory that kind of prompted your interest in the science fields? Well, yes, I do. Um, when I was growing up as a family, we'd always watch the national news while eating supper together. And on the national news during, during that time in the late 50s and early 60s, the space race was going on. And the Soviet Union beat us to the space for the first mission. But then the United States 
caught up a little with John Glenn and then the Apollo space missions. And this all piqued my interest in engineering and mathematics. And behind everything they did were these computers. And that's why I decided to go into the um, computer field. All right. Sarah, there is often someone special in a young person's life, a teacher, a mentor, someone who kind of helps spark that interest in the science field. Was there anyone like that for you? Actually, there was. Um, I was quite fortunate. Both my parents were supportive in me in, you know, the science and math areas. But while I was at school, they had a couple of different programs that were offered. And one was the Math Counts and Future Problem Solvers and that area which would promote and kind of encourage the working with puzzles and figuring out different math problems whereas um, in addition to that program there was also a, a nature man that came in every once in a while and did science experiments and so then the whole class would gather together and you know we'd do different things like test weather things with household products and learn what things would cause explosive reactions <laughs> you know things that really catch a youth's attention so just kind of spurred the interest. All right. Well, here at Team Quest, you guys are involved in, in, in a layman's nutshell, in helping information run more smoothly through the systems that it exist. Um, David, on a on a daily basis, what what do you do? What's your typical job? Give us a job title, and then tell us what your day-to-day -day activities are like. Well, our job titles around here are software engineers, commonly known as computer programmers, and we set at a desk and work at a computer and what we do is we um, get requirements from the customer and we write computer code to satisfy those requirements and go through compiling and debugging and testing that and we do this as a team at TeamQuest. We work together as a team. We definitely have many meetings throughout um, the day that we're away from our desk and at a, at a conference room meeting with the team. Sarah, in your experience, when you do your daily work, give us a sense of, is math useful? I mean, what kind of subjects that you studied in your education helped you prepare for the work that you do today? Well, um, honestly, it kind of depends on what team you're on. There's some teams that are very math intensive. There's other ones that are um, kind of working together as far as figuring how things are going to act in the future. So it's kind of an understanding of how things, the reaction of what different code's going to do and what you can anticipate and what you can plan for. And so the math is a high part and then learning how to test it, the planning, so you have to understand the incomes and the outgoes. And so all that kind of processes that you kind of develop as a kid all kind of plays in here. Sarah, you happen to be local talent. <laughs> you were originally from this area, grew up around here and, and are now working in a local company. Tell us why it was important to you to find a company that you could work for with this advanced degree. Well, uh, growing up, I was always close to my family. And um, my mom was a teacher, my dad was a farmer. And so you kind of have that close bond with the family and the community. And then going away to college, I always knew I wanted to come back to this area. I just didn't know how quickly I'd be back to this area. You guys are both Iowa State alums. But David, uh, you guys probably recruit here at Team Quest from a number of universities. Where do, where do you go to find graduates? What kind of degrees are you looking for to fill the jobs that take place in this company? Well, sticking to the technology end of the company, we definitely recruit nationwide. But our most intensive recruitments are in the local colleges and universities. Um, for example, Iowa State, University of Iowa, Wartburg, Luther and Decorah, um, Winona State, Minnesota State, and Mankato, University of Minnesota. That's where most of our people come from that work in the technology department. And primarily computer science engineers? Is that what you're looking for? Computer engineers or computer science majors. Talk a little bit, if you would, about TeamQuest's role in the community as an economic driver. TeamQuest Corporation, this is our global headquarters, and we have a division in Europe, but it's pretty unusual to have a company like ours in a rural area like this. Typically, a, team, a company like TeamQuest is based on the East Coast or West Coast. So it's very important to have a company like TeamQuest in a rural area. It brings in good paying jobs. It, it stimulates the economy. Um, we have 
talked to some students and, and asked them about what their interests were, what they thought they might do as future careers, and, and even the kids that have chosen advanced placement science courses and enjoyed those classes often told us that they wanted to be in marketing or in some other field, some business field, somewhat on the perception that it's more glamorous, it maybe is a little less challenging, what would you say to students who are thinking about those careers and making those career decisions to say, you know what, the sciences, engineering, mathematics, that can be really fun and interesting and glamorous too? Well, in our family, we had a saying that mathematics is fun. We set the tone of that. We did logic problems. We played games that had logic involved in them. Um, the computer games that my wife and I purchased for our children were were logic or mathematical games. At the time, I don't think our children appreciated it, but I get feedback now from my adult children that uh, when they talk to their friends, you mean you didn't do mental math when you were driving down the road? Or you didn't have logic games on your computer? <laughs> and so, I, again, I think the tone is set at home in a lot of cases. And um, I think my children all find that, that working at these problems is actually fun mm -hmm. and, and fulfilling to them mm -hmm. to solve them. All right. And so TeamQuest is, is a global company and so by being involved in the sciences you're not necessarily stuck only uh, in a cubicle behind a computer. You actually have a chance to travel the world? Right. There, there's a lot of opportunities at TeamQuest. I mean, and they promote the furthering of education, so you can go in classes and education and conferences, and so you get a little bit of the traveling. But I guess for the high school graduates and the college graduates that are, you know, kind of perplexed on whether or not they'd want to pursue it, I guess I'd say embrace the challenge because it is a lot of fun and it's very fulfilling. And I mean, we've been here for years, and I can't say there's ever been a day I've been bored. And you never know when you come around, you know, the office in the morning, what challenge you're going to face next. Then. So it's very fun. Thank you so much for joining us today and, and sharing with the audience that there are great places right here in the region that can take advantage of young people who get interested and stay interested in these STEM fields of study. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for a closer examination of the great things that are happening in our region to advance interest in and utilization of STEM fields of study. Join us Thursday, April 7th at 7 p.m. as we tackle another important issue on the heart of the matter. With field reporter Donnie Rolls, I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Good night.